Far-out political conspiracy theories have been a thing since well before the internet, and some of them are weirder than anything you've heard of today. Here are some of the weirdest conspiracy theories in 19th century American politics. Some things truly never change. Less than a decade after the American Revolution drew to a close in 1783, political parties were already firing accusations of backroom deals at each other. According to Time, Massachusetts Minister Jedediah Morris was the source of the trouble, at least on American soil. In his sermons, Morris claimed that the Bavarian Illuminati had infiltrated American society, intending to obliterate both the newly formed government and Christianity itself. He pointed to the revolution that was at the time tearing France apart, taking particular note of the atheist Jacobins who were closing French churches and promoting a secular way of life. The Illuminati, he claimed, promoted a lurid way of life that scoffed at notions of fidelity, chastity, and social order. Morris, a Federalist, went even further, attacking future President Thomas Jefferson and his Democratic-Republican Party. Soon, others fell in line with Morris's alarmist thinking, including the president of Yale. As a new century dawned, Morris's pet conspiracy theory fell out of favor, but never really went away. They're keeping secrets because they're going to take over. Even today, some Americans believe the faceless Illuminati are running things despite a considerable lack of evidence. In the early decades of the 19th century, American nativists were fighting for their rights against so-called invaders, but these nativists weren't indigenous to North America. Instead, as Smithsonian Magazine reports, they were members of a quasi-secret society who purported to be of pure Anglo-Saxon heritage. And the invaders? Well, Catholics, of course. The society in question would become known as the Know Nothing Party, so-called for its members' habit of feigning ignorance of the group when questioned. The Know Nothing's principal fear was that the immigrants from majority Catholic nations, such as Ireland, were undermining the fabric of American society. The United States in the 1840s was indeed accepting a wave of Irish Catholic immigrants. And the Know Nothings claimed these Catholics weren't true Americans because they held allegiance to the Pope, who was set on destroying Protestant America. Catholics were said to be guilty of gruesome misdeeds, such as murdering infants and kidnapping young women. Never mind that no evidence of such crimes was ever uncovered. In response to the accusations, the Know Nothings and other nativist political groups helped pass laws to limit alcohol consumption and restrict immigration. This made it all the more difficult for new arrivals to participate in civic life or even find employment in their new country. The Know Nothing Party was originally called the Order of United Americans, then the Order of the Star Spangled Banner. According to Smithsonian Magazine, they evolved into an organization of powerful players and reached the height of their influence in the 1850s, becoming governors and legislators throughout the nation. They were elected largely because of their anti-immigration views, and it wasn't just Irish Catholics who were the enemy. The Know Nothings positioned German immigrants and women's rights suffragists as equally undesirable. They got people so riled up that they burned churches and formed violent gangs. The Know Nothings rose to prominence by playing on the fear and rage of their fellow Americans. But hatred wasn't a strong enough foundation, and the movement soon collapsed. As time wore on, it became more and more difficult for the party to ignore the issue of slavery, which it had tried to avoid. By ignoring the growing issue of slavery, they became irrelevant to both Northerners and Southerners. Furthermore, devotees of the party may have also realized that its vision of a United States peopled only by white Protestants was ridiculously unattainable. In the lead-up to the Civil War, widespread political conspiracies focused on what was the most divisive issue at that point in American history, slavery. Southern slave owners became convinced that agents from the North were infiltrating their communities and wreaking havoc to undermine their way of life. During the 1830s, one of the prevailing theories was that abolitionists were actually being directed by the British, who were intent on destroying rebellious American democracy and economic competition. Others argued that the call was coming from inside the House, and that bigwigs in the Republican Party were conspiring to outlaw slavery. They became known as Black Republicans. Kernels of truth further inflamed these conspiracies. As The Guardian reports, Abraham Lincoln, himself a Republican, referred to the, quote, ultimate extinction of slavery in 1858. Although the party did work to limit the expansion of slavery, pre-Civil War Republicans did little to actually stop the practice or roll back the institution. But for some Southern leaders, those details didn't matter. William Harris, who advocated for the secession of Mississippi, wrote, Mississippi will never submit to the principles and policy of this black Republican administration. Although it wasn't true, this conspiracy had some very real effects. While Southern slave owners were becoming alarmed at the idea of outsiders working to disassemble their culture and economy, anti-slavery abolitionists had their own suspicions. The slave power conspiracy alleged that slave owners had infiltrated all levels of the government and were working to make their way of life the norm for all. 
Though abolitionists on their own may not have been able to make it all the way to the Emancipation Proclamation, plots, designs, and schemes notes that they were given a boost by the slave power conspiracies and other suspicions. Northerners who were previously indifferent to slavery or who even had some seriously racist beliefs began to believe that maybe, just maybe, Southerners were worming their way into too much power. Some even believed that it went all the way to the top, with the president himself either one of them or too weak to resist the slave power lobby. Though there was no evidence to support this, the slave power suspicions united many disparate groups in the buildup to the Civil War. Scholars even argue that, strange as it may have sounded to some, this particular conspiracy led to the rise of the Republican Party in the 19th century. While some American political conspiracies may have seemed laughable in the first decades of the 19th century, they became harder to ignore as time went on. Tensions over the issue of slavery grew, as did fights over just how states were supposed to handle the issue. They did not want to be in a government run by a northern anti-slavery party. Eventually, things reached a breaking point. On December 20, 1860, South Carolina became the first state to secede from the Union. This and the following secessions were touched off by the 1860 election of Republican Abraham Lincoln. Yet, a closer look at secession declarations shows that conspiracies absolutely played a role in the breakup of the Union. In its declaration of secession, Texas was convinced the North had sent emissaries to stir up trouble in its territory. This didn't just involve undermining Southern culture or spreading fear and doubt in the minds of Southerners. It also included more obvious crimes, including such nefarious acts as poisoning the water supply and committing arson in towns throughout the state. According to The Atlantic, other states made similar claims, arguing that Lincoln and his allies wanted not only to upend their way of life, but to kill Southerners. Given Lincoln's recorded intent to reconcile with the South after the Civil War ended, to the point that even his allies thought he was being too soft on the rebels, this seems all the more unbelievable. In the 19th century, Americans thought the threat of a slave rebellion loomed large. Could enslaved people pull off a large-scale revolt? The idea makes sense. According to Britannica, the Haitian Revolution concluded in 1804 after a rebellion ousted the French and established the first country to be run by former slaves. They timed their uprising to start on multiple plantations, and they swore each other to secrecy. Was it such a stretch to imagine that a similar thing might happen on U.S. soil? As The Atlantic points out, slave rebellion did occur in the U.S., and so did conspiracy theories about organized slaves on the threshold of revolution, perhaps helped along by abolitionists. It didn't help that John Brown encouraged an armed uprising among slaves in 1859 Virginia. Yet, for he is on the side of justice, and you are on the side of chains! Never mind that his attack failed and Brown himself was executed later that year. For some, it was enough evidence to confirm a widespread slave rebellion plot, and fear-mongering spread with fantastical tales of vicious, well-organized people who wanted nothing more than bloody revenge. It was only a short step from that to believe that emancipation would be the end of all white people. On April 14, 1865, President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by actor John Wilkes Booth. According to history, Booth had assembled a small group of conspirators to first kidnap Lincoln. When that plot failed, they decided to murder the president. Six the South is but was the assassination really the work of only a few people? As Ford's theater reports, some thought the plot was beyond the abilities of a second-rate actor and his friends. And almost immediately after Lincoln's death, newspapers began hinting that the president's demise was the work of a larger, more organized group of Southern rebels. The roster of potential masterminds behind the supposed plots included Confederate President Jefferson Davis and Confederate Secretary of State Judah P. Benjamin. Old religious prejudices came into play, with some arguing that Benjamin, who was Jewish, was influenced by a larger network of anti-Lincoln European bankers. Or was it the Catholics? After all, weren't some of the boot conspirators devout followers of the Pope? Could Irish Americans who had largely opposed the war and rioted against the Union draft be behind it? Heck, the murder might even have been ordered by Union officials who weren't keen on Lincoln's forgiving approach to the former Confederacy. However, Ford's theater points out that none of these conspiracies were ever proven true. Instead, the consensus remains that the assassination was in fact the work of Booth and a few of his associates. Conspiracy theories are usually bunk, yet every once in a while one of them turns out to be true. And in the 19th century, one conspiracy theory fooled even the president. According to the Washington Post, it all began with an assassination attempt. On July 2, 1881, Charles Guiteau shot President James Garfield at a train station. Garfield's doctor attempted to find the bullet lodged in his body by digging in the wound with unsterilized equipment and his hands. The president lingered for weeks before dying of a massive infection on September 19th. 
Before that, his doctors issued cheerful reports to newspapers saying that he was sleeping sweetly or that his eyes had regained their old-time sparkle. This was an attempt to bolster the confidence of the American public in Garfield himself, though eventually the doctors had to admit their lie when the president finally died. By now, it's probably painfully clear that conspiracy theories can have some serious consequences in the real world. They've been used as excuses to start wars, gain power, and sell newspapers. And a conspiracy theory can be used to alienate an entire group of people for no other reason than the fact that they're different. That concept may have reached its zenith with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which restricted immigrants based on Chinese racial background. According to history, the act didn't come out of nowhere. It followed years of increased worry that Chinese workers who entered the country to work in the mining and construction booms of the mid-19th century were going to bring society down. Real economic downturns, increased labor competition, and concerns about racial purity led to the passage of the act. Proponents of the act, such as San Francisco Mayor James D. Phelan, alleged that Chinese immigrants were barbaric and cunning and that they were part of a larger force that would devastate America through disease and erosion of the vaguely defined American way of life. 